Every now and then, a friend asks me whether I'd be willing to help them choose the parts for a new PC and possibly even build it. And luckily for me, every single one of them gives me complete freedom when it comes to choosing the components, so all I have to do is ask them for the budget and the use case for the PC I'm building for them. I'd say these two are the most important drivers of all my decisions when it comes to choosing the right components. But regardless of what their answers are at this stage, you know which components brings me the most joy to investigate, order and build their PCs with? The case. As you can probably already tell, this is the case I picked for this project, the Fractal North. I'm a big fan of Fractals, I've been using one of their Define R6 cases since 2018 and it still looks great. By the way, I will be retiring this system in a couple of weeks in favor of a rack mounted and water cooled one, so make sure to subscribe because that will be an interesting project. Anyway, let's also look at other components we'll fill this case with, starting at the most boring one, uh, which is the power supply. I've gone with this Seasonic Prime TX1000, rated at 80 plus titanium. Uh, as the name suggests, it can supply a thousand watts and it comes with a 12 year old warrant, not old, <laughs> 12 year warranty. 12 years. Now that I think about it, I've been recommending and using Seasonic power supplies for longer than that and have never ever encountered an issue with them. And that's not the only reason I highly recommend them. You see, most people don't understand the importance of a really good, although a little bit more expensive power supply. As I said, apart from the 12 year warranty in our case, its performance is also very important. And I'm not talking about the efficiency, which is 94% at 50% load here, but about the quality of the power supply. Not all power supplies are created equal in this manner. What do you think happens if both the CPU and GPU request a huge amount of current all of a sudden and the PSU can't handle it? Well, your system crashes. Or what happens if a lightning strikes your house and the PSU doesn't have a proper surge protection? Your computer gets fried. Do not underestimate the importance of a high quality PSU. Yes, the initial investment is a bit higher, but in my opinion, it's totally worth it. And it's one of those components that doesn't degrade with time in a significant manner, so you can easily reuse it for several, several, several systems later on. Okay, let's look at the motherboard next. Just like I swear on Seasonic for power supplies, I almost always go with ASUS when it comes to motherboards. I'm saying almost because for my personal rig, which is back there, uh, is based on X299 Skylake, I went with the EVGA Dark so that I would try and overclock the hell out of the 9900X that is in it. I did succeed, but that thing got super hot and very power hungry, so I eventually decided it's simply not worth it. The overclocking that is. For this build I have chosen the ASUS ROG Strix Z790A Gaming Wi-Fi 2. If people underestimate the importance of power supplies, then they overestimate the importance of motherboards. For me, the most important part was obviously supporting the 14th for, for, for the supporting the 14th gen CPU we went with, more on that shortly, uh, supports DDR5 and has at least one PCIe 50x16 slot so that my friend can just replace slash upgrade uh, uh, the GPU in a couple of years and still have a perfectly good gaming PC for several years more. Apart from the features and compatibility, the one thing I look at in motherboards are its power stages. This particular board has 16 of them for the CPU and I won't go too much or at all into details here what those mean, but generally speaking more power stages means more cleaner power. However, more of them also make the motherboard more expensive, so we quickly start to encounter diminishing returns. Bottom line, go with a board that has at least 12 of them for an entry level build but don't go above 16 because you'll be paying more money for something you don't really need. CPU next. And here, because of the budget my friend gave me, I went all in. Intel Core i9-14900K, which is at the time of recording this video, the best of the best. Yes, I do know there are AMD X3D parts that are on par when it comes to gaming, but truth be told, I've been somewhat scared away from them lately, since I would need to pay more attention to what kind of RAM I pair them with for optimal performance. With Intel, this is a non-issue. I plug the RAM in, enable XMP, and that's the end of it. 
But isn't this CPU an overkill for mostly a gaming system, you might ask? Well, yes, it is. But if we go a bit overboard with the CPU choice now, much like with the power supply and given how Moore's law is no longer in effect, this CPU will be considered a high end for at least next three to four years and even then perfectly adequate for another three, four years after that. You see my personal rig right here behind me? It has a 9900X in it, bought in 2018. Paired with the 2080 Ti, it's still a great combo for 1440p gaming. If I put a 4080 in it, I'll have a high-end rig despite its age. Don't believe me? Check out the Steam hardware survey. Almost 60% of gamers still play in 1080p, have 16 gigs of RAM and an RTX 3060 or lower. And that survey was done on March 2024. How are we gonna cool the CPU? With this Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 5. Yep. No AIO in this system, and there's a very good reason for that. I think AO AOA, <laughs> I think AIOs are a bit of a scam. I mean, just look at the price, then look at what you're getting for your money. This Dark Rock Pro costs around 80 euros, whereas most AIOs cost you well over 150, so at least twice as much, but in many cases, three times or more. But what do you get for that? Silence? Not really. If you look at the CPU utilization in most games, it's not at 100%. I keep <laughs> rocking this. It's not at 100%. In fact, it's not even close, which means it doesn't get as hot as you might think. And consequently, the fans don't need to spin at max speed, even on an air cool system. So if it's not noise, what do AIOs bring to the table? Cooler CPU at the same level of noise? Again, the same point stands. While gaming, your CPU isn't being utilized to its fullest potential, so it doesn't really matter. But, Tomas, in Cinebench I can clearly measure the difference, you might say. And to that I reply, apart from the initial tests to make you feel happy about your system, how many times do you really run Cinebench later on? Never. And I'm not judging here, I'm guilty of the same, just saying don't put Put, don't put too much importance on synthetic benchmarks. They are rarely indicative of the real world performance. Do I get passionate about these things, don't I? So back to AIOs versus air coolers. 80 euros for the air cooler, 200 for the AIO. I'll go with the air cooler any day of the week and put the difference towards a more powerful GPU. And speaking of the GPU, for this build, we went with this Manly GeForce RDX 4080 Super. I must admit, I have never heard of Manly before, but my friend who works at a PC shop and prepared these components for me, told me this is the brand they have in stock and that they have had no problems with them in the past. And honestly, they're all based on the reference design given to all the vendors by Nvidia. So differences between one and the another are pretty negligible. I should also mention that these Manly cards are priced really well. I mean, not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. This card was almost a thousand euros, but being the second most powerful gaming GPU on the planet, that is still acceptable, or to put it differently, it did fit within the budget that my friend gave me. Now that I'm talking about it, remember the good old days when the high-end GPUs were like six to 700 euros? I miss those days. Can we go back? What else do we have here? Ah, the NVMe SSD, which honestly, there's one brand I pretty much always go with, and that's Samsung. For this particular build, I have chosen the 980 Pro 2 terabyte edition or 2 terabyte capacity, but I have used the Evo and the Evo Plus series in the past and had absolutely zero issues with any of them. In fact, I have all three versions of the 970 generation in my personal rig, 970 Pro for Windows gaming, 970 Evo Plus for uh, Mac OS and 970 for Linux. Yes, this machine was also used as a hack <laughs> for the Hackintosh for a while, but I haven't booted into it for a couple of years now because I have a Mac Studio in the rack uh, below the desk. And last but not least, we'll be using this RAM kit by G-Skill, which is the Ripjaws S5 at 6,000 mega transfers per second. RAM is again one of those components that people put too much emphasis on, but is really not worth the extra attention, especially since there's only three first party manufacturers, Samsung, Micron, and SK Hynix. 
everyone else pretty much buys their chips, bins them, then makes the PCBs, put o puts over some nice shrouds and branding, and finally sells them to consumers. Binning is actually the most important process here, because this is how they measure the performance of each chip so that they group similarly capable ones together and tune their timings to match a certain spec. And this spec is actually the most important or the most relevant number here that you need to pay attention to when it comes to RAM. So how many mega transfers per second and their timings. Lower are of course better, the timings that is, but also consequently more expensive at very little measurable increase in gaming or any other kind of performance. So when it comes to RAM, as long as it's compatible with the CPU you're using, pick whatever looks the best to you and fits into your build the most from an aesthetic perspective. I didn't even bother picking this part specifically, I just asked the guys over at Annie who provided all these parts for a recommendation and I was given this set. They also gave me amazing prices on all these parts, so if you're in the region and building your own PC, send them an email and tell them I sent you. I'll leave a link down in the description below. By the way, while we're talking about RAM, roughly half of the content on this channel is sharing my journey in which I'm trying to build and manufacture a high-end router from scratch, and on that router we're using 8GB of Micron RAM, which will be directly soldered on the PCB. How is that relevant, you might ask? Well, once we get to actually routing the RAM traces on the PCB and later on placing it on the in the manufacturing stage, we will talk much more in depth what those timings mean and how they impact its performance. So if you're curious about how RAM works on a more fundamental uh, level, uh, subscribe to the channel and join me on that journey. The only part I haven't given any explanation for is the case. And that's simply because I've never built in it before. So. Let's fix that now! As you can see, I'm wearing another shirt, and that's because I'm recording this the day after. Turns out, there's a lot of extra work when you're trying to build a PC and also film the whole process for YouTube. Anyway, now I'm done, and well, I have some thoughts. For the most part, 
Building in this case wasn't a problem at all. In fact, I love how bare bones it ships, um, no bells and whistles, and I mean that in a good way. Apart from the PSU shroud, there's no hidden compartments, no small panels you have to remove in order to mount something or route a cable. Just the main chamber for, you know, the motherboard and the one for the PSU, which is plenty spacious to access from the backside uh, should you need to replace a cable, for example. And replace I did because while I was cleaning the leftovers as Windows was installing, I found the 12 volt high power cable in the PSU box. One that splits into two 6-pin connectors on the PSU side so that what we're left with on the GPU side is a much cleaner look. Told you it was worth investing a bit more into a high quality power supply. Okay, and now for the parts I didn't particularly like. First, the top panel could latch onto the case a bit more strongly because a simple bump is enough for me to remove it by accident. That being said, PCs, once they're in place, are rarely touched, apart from the power button that is, so I'm not going to dock too many points for that. But the one thing that really doesn't do this case justice are the front two fans that it ships with. First, they're loud and feel cheap. Now. Luckily for me, I've built quite a few PCs over the years, so my basement is full of spare parts, 14mm uh, Noctua fans included. And here's where I encountered the case's biggest annoyance. These two fans are screwed in from the inside, meaning that once you've mounted all the internals, you better have a stubby screwdriver at hand, uh, because anything longer than say about 7cm and you'll have a not so fun time replacing them. However, it was still very worth it for me, uh, because the Noctuas that I put in don't make nearly as much noise as these two and push the case several classes up as far, of, uh, as, far as the noise performance goes. I'm not a fan. And I'm also not a fan of the anti-sag bracket that the GPU ships with either. It's clumsy to mount and it seems to be prone to sagging itself which just makes it look ugly and unprofessional. I removed it completely for the time being but I will recommend my friend to go with a third party one as the GPU is a fairly long one and definitely needs uh, the support in the long run. Because I suspect this beast will be used a lot. I've installed Windows 11 and of course Cyberpunk 2077 and with ray tracing set to ultra this thing easily runs it at 100 frames per second on an ultra wide 1440p which my friend also has. So I guess now all that's left for me is to pack it up and deliver it to him. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.